Praise the Lord. We're so glad that you've joined us today once again as we come together to worship the Lord. Wasn't that a good time of worship? Uh, I told my wife, you know, I want you to uh, pick out songs that talk about the beauty of the Lord because that's what I would talk about today, the beauty of the Lord. If you have your Bible, I want you to turn to the book of Acts, the 20th chapter. Last week, my wife uh, taught a great message on just the trials that we are uh, destined to that the Bible talks about that we must go through and eventually we we'll go through it. We don't know a lot about suffering uh, in America for the gospel because we've been so blessed uh, economically. We live in the greatest nation uh, on the face of the earth and yet uh, we see that our nation declining and we know that uh, we are eventually at some time going to experience suffering for the gospel, that we're going to have persecution. The Bible says that those who will live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. If you're living your life out in a godly way, in an ungodly world, you will be persecuted. And so at the end of her teaching, I got up a little bit, I felt from the Lord to just share with you um, that uh, whatever persecution may come against the Christian church here in America, in the United States, the only way really to be ready for that, because a lot of people, the Bible predicts it, uh, that appear to be Christians, that appear you know, to be in the Lord, um, uh, are really just kind of followers from a distance. Their heart is from, far from God. They, maybe they like just to, you know, to be around uh, Christian people. But Jesus said in the last days, many would say to him, Lord, Lord, but they really are not uh, in a relationship with Christ. Uh, and that's kind of sad to be in a religion uh, or just live a religious life and really not be saved. Uh, but when the persecution comes, I said that the only way to be ready for it is to love Jesus more than you love anything else. Uh, and if you don't, you're not ready. Because uh, we see in the Bible where people had to even lay down their life. And history tells us the history of the church, if you've ever studied uh, you know, the martyrs and the people who gave their life, the apostles who gave their life for Christ and the message they believed in. Um, I'm sure they were just as scared as anybody else, but there was something that allowed them to be able to do that. And I believe that the scripture uh, tells us and bears this out that it is the love for Christ that uh, will overshadow anything else. Uh, we may have to endure persecution before Jesus comes back the way we read in the Bible where people were actually, you know, uh, outlawed, thrown in jail, even put to death for the gospel. Jesus told his disciples, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. He didn't send us into a comfortable environment as disciples. He said, when you're going to take a message to the world that the world really doesn't want to hear because they think they're okay. And uh, God's word says they're not, and none of us were. Uh, and so he said, I'm sending you as sheep in the midst of wolves. And that's kind of a, quite a graphic picture because we know what a sheep is and we know what a wolf is. And when you have sheep, well, you don't want to put them in the presence of wolves, right? Uh, but Jesus said, I'm sending you out. And it's like sheep in, the midst of, sheep in the midst of wolves. And so he told his disciples, be therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Be wise, but be harmless. And so um, when persecution comes, I believe this is really the key. Whom do we love the most? Because whoever or whomever you love the most is really the one or the thing that you're willing to suffer for. Uh, Jesus in the Bible, in his teaching and the whole scripture, uh, points us to the fact that God is worthy of our worship. Can you say amen? amen? Jesus, as Lord of our life, demands the priority of worship. And that's why he said things like, if you love your mother or your father more than you love me, he said, you're not worthy of me. That's Matthew 10, 37. Uh, the Bible tells us in Colossians 1, 18, that Jesus is to be preeminent in the church. He is to hold first place. The word preeminent means to be above everything else, to be first. And so Jesus is called, is the, is the one who holds preeminence over all things. Why? Because he is the head 
of the body, the church, he says here. He's the beginning. Uh, he is the firstborn from the dead. And Paul said, so that in all things, if I say all things, that includes you and I, he may have the first place, the preeminence. So the church, I believe, is uh, the church of Christ is in a desperate need to return to its first love. Uh, the Lord said to the church in Revelation chapter 2, verse 3 and 4, that he had, uh, you know, the church that had persevered, had had patience, that labored for the name of the Lord. I mean, they had become weary. They hadn't become weary in all their work. They were very busy. But the Lord said, I have one thing against you. I have this thing against you. He said in verse 4, that you have left your first love. Can you imagine being busy in, in, in religious things or even in the church and ministry? So busy that you don't have time for Jesus. <laughs> Right? It, 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 that just kind of baffles me. But it happens. It happens to me. It happens to all of us. We have to guard against that. Because real ministry comes not just so much from studying. Real ministry comes from what Jesus is doing inside your own heart. And if you ever want to find, you know, uh, to, uh, the, 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 the desire to love people and to pray for them. Because you know, I don't have that much, you know. Well, fall in love with Jesus first. Because if you don't, all you'll be doing is just religious work, just religious stuff, you know. Uh, and it might be good things to do. But because you have left really the source from which all those things really uh, acquire life, Jesus is the foundation. Uh, so Jesus tells the church here of Ephesus, you have left your first love. Now, you work tirelessly. You haven't gotten tired. You know, you've, you're doing all these things. But I want you to return to your first love love because passion and love for Jesus isn't something that you can whip up it isn't something you say you know what I, I I'm just going to be more passionate for Jesus it isn't something that you just do uh, it's something that the Lord listen as you come near to him as you draw near as you call on him as you inquire uh, to him as you seek his help that you begin to develop that passion for Jesus Christ can you say amen, amen. now in Acts chapter 20 did I tell you to turn there? Acts chapter 20, verse 24. This is actually our theme verse for the year 2024, right? And can you guess why? <laughs> yeah, it's the scripture, right? Acts 20, 24. And as I was meditating this before the year's end, the Lord dropped this in my spirit and said, uh, you know, uh, proclaim this as a theme year, uh, as a theme scripture for the year, rather. Uh, Paul uh, has been warned by people uh, in his ministry not to go to Jerusalem because they know that he's going to find all kinds of persecution there and they're going to, uh, you know, abuse him and they're going to even throw him in prison. Uh, and then Paul tells them, listen, the Holy Spirit has already told me that. Uh, in the verse before, he says, the Holy Spirit uh, uh, bears witness to me that uh, in every city that I go, that if I go to Jerusalem, chains and tribulations await me. Now, most of us, if we knew there was trouble waiting for us in a city, well, we were not, well I'm not going to go there. <laughs> no, we're not going to go there, you know. And, and it's probably wise if, if, it's, if you're going there for something else. But Paul knew that he had a mission to fulfill, a ministry that God had given him, and he needed to be faithful. And he said, and God has called me to go to Jerusalem. And yet he warns me that all these things, in other words, he prepares me that all these things are there. And that's why in this message I'm telling you, you need to prepare for persecution because it's coming. It's coming to America. It's coming in a way that we have really never experienced before. You say, when is that going to happen? I don't know. It could be in the next few years. It could be in the next decade. I don't know. You're, if you're old, you might miss it. But your kids and grandchildren will experience it. And so you need to not only know yourself, but you need to teach them the importance of being ready to live in a culture like Daniel did. And Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego in a Babylonian culture that is, uh, you know, uh, adrift with, that you're going to be down to. And your kids are going to be called to acknowledge and accept and embrace. And so Paul says, I know these things are awaiting me. But notice what he says in verse 24. But none of these things, what? They move me. You say, well, how do I get to a point where things like that and, and, and persecution of Christ doesn't move me? 
Because pastor, right now, I don't know, you know, I, I know if somebody came up to me and said, hey, you know, I'm going to kill you if you don't renounce your faith. I, I don't know what I do. You know, I, I don't know if I'm ready for that. Well, Paul said that none of these things move me. I don't count my life dear to myself. Why, Paul? So that I may finish my race with joy. So that I may finish the race, the spiritual race that I'm in with joy. And that I may finish, he says, the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus Christ. Did you know that as a Christian, all of us, we have a ministry. All of us have been called because ministry is service. All of us are called to serve the Lord. All of us are called to serve others. Paul says, the ministry that the Lord has given me, he said, I have received from the Lord Jesus. And then he, he qualifies that it, it is to testify, to give testimony to the gospel of the grace of God. In other words, if avoiding persecution means I don't speak, then that's not for me, Paul says. Because I've received this ministry from the Lord and I want to run my race with joy. I don't want to uh, die a coward. I don't want to die, you know, in the dark, hiding somewhere. He said, I'm going to run my race with joy. I know what expects me, what is expecting me in, or what's waiting for me in Jerusalem. I know that. The Holy Spirit has already told me and warned me. But I don't count these things, he says, as important. I don't count even my own life dear to myself so that I may finish my course. Now, here's a man who is passionate for Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? Now, he knows because the other apostles obviously have told him because he wasn't a, around as a disciple of Jesus. When Jesus was teaching, he was converted after the resurrection. But he knew from the other apostles, Jesus had taught things like this. He said, whoever uh, will uh, keep his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake, Jesus said, will find it. So Paul was very passionate about the Lord and he was willing even to suffer loss as we're going to find out in a minute, for the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus as Lord. Look at Philippians chapter 3 with me. And here, Paul begins to write about his former life as a Pharisee. Paul had been a very religious man. He was advancing in religion, as the book of Galatians says, above all his contemporaries. I mean, this guy was moving up in the religious world. He was being noticed. He was being trained by one of the best uh, uh, teachers in Jerusalem, Gamaliel, he sat under the feet of Gamaliel. And so he was being uh, 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 a success, if you would, in the religious realm. And so he writes to the Philippians and he reminds him, he says to them, finally, brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the mutilation. He's warning here about religious people particularly his brand, the Pharisees, right? the evil workers, he calls them, those who mutilate, those who's, who's, who care more about you being circumcised and keeping you know, uh, uh, the law than to understand the gospel. And he says, for we are the circumcision. He says, beware of those who want to mutilate you. They just want to circumcise, but we're the circumcision, he says. Those of us who are in Christ, we worship God in the spirit. And we rejoice in whom? In Christ. You see, Paul's rejoicing before had been in religion and how he was advancing and how he was moving forward. But he says, our rejoicing now is in Christ. And we have no confidence in the flesh. Then he says, for though I might have confidence in the flesh. In other words, if we're going to talk about just confidence in yourself as a person, let me tell you about me. If I might have confidence in the flesh... He says in verse 4, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. And then he gives us his whole, you know, religious pedigree. He says, I was circumcised on the eighth day. In other words, that's what the law demanded and that's what I did. He said, I'm of the, of the stock of Israel. I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. See, I know where I come from. I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. I'm no half-breed. He said, I, I am a Hebrew of Hebrews. Concerning the law, I'm a Pharisee, the strictest, you know, uh, sect of the law. I mean, the Pharisees, they tied down to the, you know, to the mint, man. Yeah, your little mint and rue, he says, we, you, know, you got to tithe on that, you got to do that, you know, and every little detail he was uh, 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 concerned with. So I'm a Pharisee of Pharisees. He says, concerning zeal, he says, nobody's more sellers than me. I persecuted the church. I was the one who was going after these guys who, who were talking about Jesus. And concerning righteousness, which is in the law, blameless. In other words, he looked at himself and he thought, everything the law said, I, I've tried to do. Although he, 
Now he realizes that as a Christian that, you know, his righteousness didn't reach uh, the, the full measure of the law because all of us have broken it. But he talk, he's talking about his past life. As, as far as righteousness in the law, everything that the law was supposed to do, I did it. It's all blameless. Verse 7, but what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Now notice, now he begins to talk about his life in Christ. These things that I consider important now, I have counted them as loss. But not just loss, but lost for Christ. Yet I indeed also count all things lost, notice, for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. In other words, I have traded that so that I may have the excellences of the knowledge of Christ. How many of you want to know Christ better? You see, I know Christ in salvation. I know Christ in, in, in areas of my life. But I don't know him in the fullness of who he is. I want to. I realize that I lack so much. And oftentimes that I find myself, uh, you know, stumbling in my own walk and and I, and, I, and, I, and I get down on myself and I realize that's not who Jesus is. I mean, the other day I lost my temper. I don't do that very often, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> and my wife's going, okay. Okay. So, so I, you know, and, and, I, and, and after, you know, I thought for a while, I said, Lord, why do I keep doing that? Jesus, help me. And I called out to the Lord. Have you ever done that? I mean, that's the time you need to do it. That's the time you need to say, Lord, oh, help me. Help me, Lord. I realize, you know, how weak I am oftentimes, uh, you know, uh, in, in certain areas. I said, Lord, help me. And so Paul said, I've traded all these things for the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus, my Lord. Verse 8, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. You see, he lost his reputation. He lost his place. He lost uh, any inheritance that he had uh, as a Jew, the Jewish faith. And the admiration of the people around him that he was so concerned with, that people looked up to him. He wanted to become this great rabbi in religion. Now he said, I've everything, I've lost it all. But notice he didn't say, man, I lost it all. He said, I lost it all. And I count that as dung. You say, pastor doesn't say dung. Yeah, that's the Greek word. Kaka. For those of you that know Spanish. <laughs> Done. I mean, that's what you find in the latrine, folks. Now, that's pretty graphic, isn't it? But Paul is doing that so you can understand his testimony. You thought that was great. It was nothing. He said, I count it as dung, rubbish. Why? Because my goal is to gain Christ. Verse 9. And to be found in him. Not having my own righteousness. And Paul understood that as a Pharisee. Right? He was so self-righteous. Which is from the law. It's derived from the law. But that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness which is from God. The righteousness that God gives us, people, by faith, because we believe in Christ. Then he says in verse 10, I love this part, that I may know him. Oh, listen, Paul was an apostle. He was called by God. He was preaching the gospel. He had, you know, he had received the greatest revelation of the gospel more than anybody else. Wrote three-fourths of the New Testament. And he says, I want to know him. I, I wonder if you can say that with me today. Lord, I want to know you. You know, I know you in salvation. I know you as my king and my healer. But I want to know you in your fullness. But listen... If you really want that, Paul tells us what's necessary. You need to be willing to let go of everything else. Everything else has to become secondary. 
Everything has to become third place, fourth place, fifth place. I don't know, but not first. Paul says that I may be found in him, that I may gain Christ, that I may know him. And listen, I want to know him in the power of his resurrection. What does that mean? Well, see, it was the Holy Spirit of God that raised the body of Jesus from the dead. Paul says, I want to know the power that rose Jesus from the dead. That power that gives life. Because Paul knew that to know God is to know life. To have eternal life is to have the life of God. But Paul goes on and says something very interesting. He says in verse 10, the fellowship of his sufferings. I want, the word, the word fellowship is the word it means to share together. And he says, I want to share in the sufferings of Christ. And here's where we get, my wife was talking to last week about the trials and the persecution and the suffering that can come when we stand for Christ and the gospel. And it comes in many ways. And Paul said, Christ suffered too for standing for the truth of God. Paul knew that Jesus had suffered scourging. He had suffered misunderstanding. He had suffered, you know, false accusations. And finally, he suffered death on a cross. And he said, I want to share in the sufferings that Jesus suffered. And that doesn't mean, well, I want them to crucify me. That's not what he's talking about. But the things that Jesus suffered as he ministered and he walked the earth, I want to share in that. And then he says this, I want to be conformed to his death. And again, it's not, well, he died on a cross, I want them to crucify me. Jesus walked full of life, dead to a world, dead to sin, Jesus was never, ever enticed by sin. And Paul said, I want to know that my life is conformed to the death of Christ. That's why Paul could say, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. I am crucified with Christ. And I don't live anymore, but Christ lives in me. And he says, I want to know the full expression. I want to be conformed to his death. I want to die to the things that Jesus was dead to. And Jesus was dead to anything that wasn't the will of God. And so Paul here is telling us of his life and what he desires. And then he goes on and he said, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from among the dead. Now Paul sought, obviously, as we read here, to be conformed to the death of Jesus. But why would anybody want to be conformed to or desire death in any way? Because Paul talks about, I want to share in conformity with his death. And I believe, this is my idea, I believe that Paul wanted that because he understood that Jesus' death was not an accidental death. In other words, we all know we're going to die. Paul wasn't saying, well, I want to die because Jesus died. Well, he already knew he was going to die. We all know that if Jesus tarries, we're all going to die. But it was something more. It was Jesus, or Paul knew that Christ's death was not accidental. It was planned, in the, ordained in the purposes of God. Jesus came to the world to die. Jesus came to the world to live his life. So from the very beginning of his birth, he was already ordained to death. You and I, we're ordained to death, but for a different purpose, because we sinned against God. And so man allowed sin, and sin brought death into the world, and death passed to everybody, because all have sinned. So when Paul said, I want to be conformed to his death, he says, I want my life's to be and my death to be like Christ. Not accidental, but I want to live it in the purposes of God. Because he knew that Jesus' death, listen, was a death of obedience. The Bible says that Jesus humbled himself. Philippians chapter 2, verse 8, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death. 
Now we talk about humility. Oh, I need to be more humble. Yeah, but listen to this humility. Listen to this uh, 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 definition of humility. You become obedient to death. And that's why Jesus said, if you love your life, you'll lose it. If you lose it for me, you'll find it. And so Paul here says, Jesus humbled himself. He became obedient to the Lord to the point of death, even death on the cross. His death was a death of obedience. We're all going to die, as I said. And if Jesus tarries, but I wonder how many of us want to die just because we got old. I mean, if we're going to die, okay, I'm getting old. I wonder how many of us just want to die because we got sick. Well, there's no glory in that. <laughs> but if you say, you know what, Lord, I want my life and my death to be conformed to Jesus. I want my life and my death when I'm gone to leave a legacy behind. And so what legacy are you going to leave behind? Because you're going to give your life up for something. You're going to live your life for something. You're going to spend your life on something. What is that something you're spending your life for? Paul said, I want to spend my life the way Jesus did. I want my life to be, my, my death to be conformed to Jesus' life and Jesus' death. So Paul said, I want to know him. And I think this is the key to preparing for any persecution or anything that will come. Is to love Jesus. And everything that Jesus did for me and for you. And to passionately fall in love with Jesus that nothing else even comes close. I've been reading this week some of the works of one of perhaps the, one of the greatest living scholars on the Puritans. Joel Beakey is his name. And Beaky writes and quotes some of the Puritans. And the Puritans were very known for writing a lot about, you know, the glory of Christ and living in the glory and living in, the, in, a, in a life that glorifies God. And he quotes Richard Sibbs, who was a Puritan. And I'd like you to put up the slide if you can. He said this, he said, heaven is not heaven without Christ. Amen. It is better to be in any place with Christ than to be in heaven itself without him. He said, all the delicacies without Christ are but a funeral banquet. I say the joys of heaven are not the joys of heaven without Christ. He is the very heaven of heavens. And then uh, there was another Puritan scholar. He quotes Thomas Adams. And Thomas Adams wrote, Christ is the sole paragon of our joy, the fountain of life. The foundation of all blessedness. Christ is the sum of the whole Bible. And as I said, the Puritans loved to write about glorifying Christ. And they encouraged the people of God to live their life enjoying the beauty of the person and the work of Jesus Christ. My wife read this verse at the very beginning in Psalm 27 and verse 4. Where King David expressed this same attitude when he said, One thing I have desired of the Lord. And that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord, in the presence of the house of God, the people of God, where God's presence is. All the days of my life, he said, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. David said, I have asked the Lord for this thing and I'm seeking after it. I want to behold the beauty of the Lord in the house of God, in the midst of the people of God. Listen, there are a lot of people that come to church, but they come to criticize and they come to complain and they come to see who didn't do what or what. Why do you come to church? You see, David said, I want to be in the presence of God's people, in the house of God. And I don't want to look at them and criticize them. Lord, I, I want to see your beauty. And you know what? When you, when you take that attitude, you see the beauty in a lot of things. Sometimes, you know, after the service, I, I'll see people praying for one another. And it touches my heart. I say, God, thank you. 
I don't say, hey, I'm the pastor, I should pray for people. No, you know what? Thank you, God, for the concern that you put in the heart of that brother or sister to pray for them. Thank you. I see the beauty of the Lord in his people as they do that. To behold the beauty. Another translation says the delightfulness of the Lord. The things that delight and thrill my soul about the Lord. Now Paul said here in Philippians 3.10 that he had laid everything aside. That he had once considered gain. That he may know Christ and the resurrection power of Christ. You know, when you begin to pursue. Remember David said, I want to behold the beauty of the Lord. He said, I asked the Lord for this. Remember I told you that you can't whip up passion for Christ. Okay, well I'm just going to love the Lord more. Well, if you could do that, you'd do that towards your wife. Or husband. Yeah, I want to love my husband more. But you know, you're like, you know why? Because you're a weak creature. You don't have the power as a source of life and love inside you as a human being. The Holy Spirit is that source inside of you. And this is why David said, listen, you might have missed it. One thing I have asked of the Lord. What did he do? I asked the Lord. Why did he just say, well, I just want to behold the beauty of the Lord. He says, I want to behold the beauty of the Lord. I've asked the Lord to give me that. Some of you don't love the Lord like you should because you really haven't asked him for that. And some of you say, well, I've asked him, but have you sought after him? You see, what happens after you ask is just as important as when you ask. I said, Lord, I want to know you. I want to behold your glory. I wonder if anybody's contacted me on Facebook. Ooh, look at that. Ooh, like, 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 like. Like, like. David said, I asked the Lord. I want to behold the beauty of the Lord. When I come among your people, among your temple, Lord, I want that to be my focus. If you find that you're a person that when you come to church, you're always looking and criticizing. Before you come, you need to ask the Lord for that. Lord, just let me go and see the beauty. Don't let me see all the other stuff because there's other stuff. There. Just let me see the beauty. Just let me concentrate my focus on you. Let me see the beauty of the Lord. I have asked the Lord for that and I'm going to seek after that. So what comes after you ask is just as important. What do you do then? You say, Lord, I need to start putting some of these other things aside because they're taking my time from seeking you. And all of a sudden, you begin to realize that when you start doing that, and the Lord, all of a sudden, seems like it's closer. Like, I love the Lord. And it's, but he says, what's that grin on your face for? And I, I just had an encounter with Jesus. And you know, people that don't love the Lord like that, they'll go like, oh, brother. Oh, brother. <laughs> you know, religious people and the world will think you're nuts. They'll think you're nuts. You know, sometimes I, I, I sometimes you know I, I get so overwhelmed, and you, you, you see me. I, I, it doesn't bother me. I'm not ashamed of it. You know, it just it just breaks me inside. I just start to weep. Before you know, I, I used to when I was younger. I used to I used to care so much what people thought. Oh, what are they going to think of me? I don't care. Amen. Because the approbation of God over my soul that's important to me. And so when God touches my heart, you know, I, I think Gamma was preaching up here the other day and, and all of a sudden he was like, <laughs> I just, just get so emotional. I'm thinking, that's because God touches your heart. Amen. And I, if he's here, somebody said, don't, 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 don't worry about that. You do that if you need to. What people think doesn't matter. Amen. What God thinks is what matters. 
And you know, so Paul is saying, I want to know the Lord, the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings. So when you get this knowing, when this knowing starts to grow, you start to set aside those things. You say, well, how is it that I fall passionately in love with Jesus? You need to understand that there are things that you're going to have to set aside. And you know, look at Acts 20, 24 again, because Paul here tells us one thing that, that, that he laid aside. Listen, he said, none of these things move me, nor do I count my what? My life, dear to myself. If I did, I wouldn't go because I've already been warned, not only by people, but by God, that they're suffering and persecution awaiting me. But you know what? I love Jesus. And Jesus is calling me to take the gospel everywhere. And Jerusalem is part of where I need to go. And if this is the time for me, then that's the time for me. And I'm going to run my race. I'm going to run it with joy. I'm not going to run it in fear, and I'm going to fulfill the ministry which I've received of the Lord, to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. In other words, to testify of the gospel is more important to me than even my own life. Amen. And most of us don't have that passion for Jesus because our life still matters to us more. The things that we have matter to us still more. The things that we should consider as done, they're still up here, man. They're like, we like to show off our dung. Right? But Paul said, these things don't move me. So if you are looking to follow passionately in love with it, and see, this is like anything else. Whenever you're going to follow the Lord Jesus, you've got to count the cost. He said, I want to follow passionately in love with Jesus, but I don't want to leave the things I do. I don't want, you know, I still want to have that as most important in my life. Well, Jesus said, then you're not worthy of me. But when I realized that he's worthy of everything as Lord and creator of my life, then I'm willing, they said, not to endear myself so much with my own life that it stops me from falling in love with Jesus and fulfilling the purpose of my life according to his will. See, to know the beauty of the Lord and to find satisfaction in his sufficiency. Christ is sufficient for me. In his beauty and his loveliness. You and I, we have to practice the duty of every believer. The chief duty. Isaac Ambrose said, another uh, Puritan. What is that? He said this. Put the slide up for me, please. Ambrose, another Puritan says, The look of our minds and hearts whereby we not only see spiritual things, but we are affected by them. I not only read about Jesus in the Bible, I not only read that he loved me and he gave his life for me, it affects my life, it affects my heart, it affects my soul. And yes, sometimes it even makes me weep because I'm so grateful for what he's done for me. And so Ambrose says, it is the look whereby when we see spiritual things, it affects us. He said, how do I know, Pastor, if I'm growing in the Lord? The truths revealed in this word are making an impact and changing your life. That's how you know. It isn't just because I've been to 20 thousand Bible studies pastor in my life. I've been to conferences. I've been, I, I listen to tapes all the time or I listen to CDs or whatever. How is it changing your life? The look that sees and is affected. Hebrews, or excuse me, Colossians chapter 3. Let's go there for a moment. In Colossians 3, Paul writes to the believers in Colossae, listen, if then you were raised with Christ, what does that mean? If you're a Christian, if you really are alive in Christ, what does he say? What's the next word? Seek. seek. One thing I desire of the Lord, David said, that will I seek. 
See, people who were raised with Christ seek things. What are you seeking? I'm seeking the things which are above. In other words, the heavenly things. The things that God has ordained for me. The things that God has revealed for me. He says, and I'm looking where? Where Christ is. Again, our view, our look, as Ambrose says. We see spiritual things. You say, well, I can't see Jesus sitting at the right hand of the Father. It is revealed in Scripture. It is declared to us. This is the spiritual reality. This is the truth. And so God has raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his own right hand. Remember, Paul said that I might know the power of his resurrection. I know Christ was raised. He is seated at the right hand of God. And I am seeking now those things that are above where he sits at the right hand of God. Verse 3, he says, I do it because I'm, I've died. He said, set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. Verse 3, because I have died. I'm di I've died. And my life, he says, now is what? It's hidden. You know why you can't find the life often that Christ called you to? Because you're too busy in the one that you're living. And the one that he called you is a hidden life. It is a life that is hidden with Christ, not separate from Christ. It is hidden with Christ, where Christ becomes all in all, all sufficient for me, that I am willing to put everything else second place. I am dead to the world, Paul said, and the world is death, dead to me. I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, he said, I live, yet not I, Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh here, I live by faith in the Son of God. In other words, I'm looking to Him. I believe Him. I trust Him. I know what He's done for me. And I look at all that in the beauty of His person. My life is hidden with Christ in God. As I was uh, thinking about the beauty of Christ and the work of Christ... Because you can't separate those things. You fall in love because of who he is and because of what he's done for you. When you really understand what God has done in salvation for you. And I was reading that scripture in Romans 8 where it says that Christ is seated at the right hand of God. We just read it here uh, in, in, a verse, in a few verses before. You see, Christ is elevated. He was raised by the power of the Spirit, the power of resurrection that Paul said he wanted to know, and he's seated at the right hand of God, the Father, seated in authority and in power. You say, well, what is Christ doing there? Well, he's taking it easy. That's what most people think. I mean, if I was sitting next to the king, I'd, that's great, he's taking it easy. That's not what Jesus is doing, though. Anybody know what Jesus is doing at the right hand of the Father? He is praying for you. And why would Jesus need to pray for you? Because without him, Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. Everything that God requires takes power. The power of God. To infuse you with life. To do it. Remember I told you even the willingness to do it. Comes from God's power. He is at work in you to will. And to do the things that please him. Amen. And so when you want to please God. You ask him. God help me to please you. God help me. To please you in all that I do. You're at work in me. And so I was meditating on this verse that says that Christ is seated at the right hand of God who also intercedes for us. And I said, Lord, you're doing that for me. Because you know I need it. I don't know, there might be somebody here who says, well, he can pray for you, I don't need it, I'm fine. <laughs> and I say, you're far from the kingdom of God. <laughs> Listen, Paul, or excuse me, Peter, he said basically that. 
They need to pray for me. Lord, pray for them. Right? And there are people like that. Lord, I will never deny you. I will never leave you. Now these might leave you. Remember that? If all of these leave you, I will never leave you. Now if Jesus ever did an eye roll, that was it. <laughs> right? Because he said, Peter, before the cock crows, you will have denied me. And he even told, me, told him how many times? Not once, three times. You're not just weak, you're triple weak. <laughs> Listen, and this is what really got me. And I, I, as I was contemplating the, the beauty of the Lord and, and the beauty of what he's done and he's doing for me. But I have prayed for you. That your faith will not fail. Means if I don't do this for you, your faith will fail you. But that your faith not fail, I have prayed for you, Peter. And listen, Jesus is so confident in his prayer for his people that he said, and when you are converted, when you come back. Now he didn't say, well, hopefully you'll come back. I hope the Father hears my prayer for you. Because you're going to fall. Satan has desired to sift you. And it wasn't just that God allowed him to be sifted for no reason at all. No, Peter was proud. Pride comes before a fall. So it didn't take long for the devil to say, hey, look at that. Pride. I'm going to... So Jesus said, you're going to fall. You're going to deny me three times. But, Paul, but, but he said, Peter, I have prayed for you. And when, you are re- when you're converted, when you return, he said, feed your, minister to your brothers. So I was, I was reading that and I said, Lord, wow. Thank you for your love. And see, this is when you start contemplating the beauty of the Lord. Realize, without you, I'm nothing. And you're available to me. You love me. And you love me even though I was unlovable. Before I was even lovable, you loved me. When I was your enemy, when I was not wanting anything to do with you, you died for me. And I find myself looking at these spiritual truths, as Isaac Ambrose said, and it affects me. It's real to me. Because whenever I find myself in a weak place, I said, Lord, I know you love me, and I know in spite of all this, that you're praying for me. Thank you. And I mean, if Christ was here in person, I'd put my arms around him and hug him real tight. And I said, thank you for loving me. As you contemplate the truths of God, as you, I've run out of time, but I, I want to talk to you next week about, see, see, this is what the writer of Hebrews called Putting your eyes on Jesus. See, we put our eyes on a lot of things that, man, they just mess us up. I mean, you got people everywhere looking at the wrong thing. I mean, there are people today who believe that the entire, the entirety of their existence is based on their sexuality. Think about that. It is insane. That's their whole identity. And if you don't agree with that, I'm going to kill you or slap you or stone you or cancel you. And I'm going to see you never work again. And you know what you ought to have for those people? Compassion and pity. Because they don't know 
where they stand. But now you know as a Christian related to Christ, and this is why Paul said, those things it lost for the excellency of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. And when you focus on Christ and you fall in love with him and what he's done and it affects you, there isn't anybody that comes and say, deny him or else. I'm not denying the one I love. Well, we're going to do this. Well, do what you need to, but I'm not going to do that. And this is why Paul could say at the end of his life, I fought a good fight. He's in prison in Rome, in Mamertine prison, going to be beheaded. History tells us that he was taken out out of Mamertine prison, walked a little while, and beheaded for the gospel of Christ. Nobody around. Nobody was there to encourage him. But before he goes, I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I have kept the faith. There is therefore waiting for me. Listen, he's so, he's so confident because he knows the, the love of Christ. He says, there's waiting for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge. Wait a minute, Paul. He's a judge. He's righteous. Yes. But he is my savior. I know him in the beauty of his salvation. And he said, and the, the righteous judge will give me that day that crown of righteousness. Not because he earned it, but because Christ earned it for him. And, he's, and, and he was the lover of his soul. I don't know where you stand in your love for Christ. But I'm telling you as your pastor, and, you know, years will come, years will go if the Lord tarries. And I hope you never remember that. I hope you never forget this and remember it always. The way to stand in the gospel when persecution comes is to love Jesus more than you love anything else, even your own life. Would you stand with me? Bow your head for a moment. Father, as we stand here in your presence, and we have beheld the beauty of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. As we have beheld him and his glory as, as Savior. As we think about him, glory as deliverer and healer. I pray, Lord, that we will fall more and more in love with him. That you will give us the desire of our heart. And may we today pray and say, Lord... Let me behold the beauty of the Lord as I never have before. Let this year be different for me. And so, Father, as we stand here in your presence, I pray for every person whose heart reaches out to you right now and says, Lord, you're beautiful to my soul. Yes, Father, we praise you, Jesus. Your heavenly throne, so soon. 
us, remind us of how desperately we need you, Lord. Remind us, Lord, that you are available for us, seated at the right hand. Because you care and love us, you intercede for us. Reveal your beauty, God, to each and every one whose heart is desirous. And may they seek after you. In Jesus' name. Go with us today as we leave. And allow us, Lord, the privilege as we see the sunrise to remind us that you are the son of righteousness. As we see the cattle and we see the sheep reminding us that you're our good shepherd. As we see the stars at night remind us that you are the bright and morning star. As we see even the rocks in our path, in our way, remind us that you are the stone upon which our life is found. Go with us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. The Lord bless you and keep you.